So welcome to Math of Sports. So come on, there you go, excellent. And so the lecture has been changed a little bit because I was using the hoop in my Math 150 class today to talk about how you can prove the geometric series formula by playing a game of hoops. And so what I'm going to do is since there was a request, we'll quickly do that and then we'll go to the main topic for today. It actually illustrates one of the most important concepts in all of mathematics, namely the idea of, well, actually, I don't want to say what it illustrates because that will give away where we're going. So I will just say it will illustrate a key idea in mathematics and economics. All right. So hopefully everybody has seen oops, the metric series formula. If R is less than one, then the sum of the powers of R is equal to one over one minus R. And this is a standard algebraic proof, which I'll get to you very shortly. It's one of the most important series in all of mathematics. One of the reasons it's so useful is if you throw away any finite number of terms and you look at what's left over, if you look at the tail, the tail itself is a geometric series. And so you can often reduce a lot of infinite calculations to finite calculations. Right. Um, just as a, whoops, a quick you know, check to see, is this reasonable? Uh, right. It's not letting me speak things well today. I don't know why. All right. so to prove that it's reasonable, let's take the special case when r equals one half and show that it really does equal two when you add up all the terms. Well, we start at time zero with somebody at the origin. They take one step forward. They've covered half the distance to two. The next step is of size one half, which again covers half the distance. The next step is of size one quarter. They cover half the distance. This is not a proof, but it does make it look extremely reasonable that the sum of you know, the powers of one half is going to converge to two. All right. So the standard proof is, you know, let's consider a finite geometric for series. When everything's a finite, we don't have to worry about convergence issues. We multiply by R and we have a telescoping sum when we subtract. All the stuff in the middle is going to cancel and we'll be left with, we'll be left with SN minus R times SN equals just the first term minus the last term. We can divide by one minus R. And when we divide by one minus R, we now get that the finite geometric series formula is one minus R to the N plus one over one minus R. If we let N go to infinity, as long as R is less than one in absolute value, this is gonna to converge to one over one minus R. It makes absolute sense that if R is not less than one in absolute value, that this should not converge because in that case, you're adding things of larger and larger absolute value and there's no way it's gonna be finite. So this is the uh, difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. You know, it is necessary if you want a sum to converge for the terms to be less than one in absolute value, but that's not necessarily sufficient. So I'll give you guys a chance to be my Calc 3 students. Who here has seen the movie Dodgeball? Cultural extra credit. The coach says, is it necessary for me to And no one gets the cultural extra credit for today. No, no Googling. Can somebody give me a necessary condition to win the Super Bowl? Win your, win your conference championship, right. And as Professor Blackwood will tell you, that is not a sufficient condition. You know, the Bills won the conference championship four years in a row. Can somebody give me a necessary condition to win the Super Bowl? Score at least once. That's sufficient. So uh, scoring at least once is not sufficient to win the Super Bowl. You can say that's necessary, but not sufficient. What's a sufficient condition to win the Super Bowl? It can be a really stupid sufficient condition. Yes. Score more points than the other team. That's both a necessary and a sufficient condition. <clears throat> Being in the Super Bowl is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient. You always want to be thinking when you're doing things, what's necessary, what's sufficient. Sometimes, of course, there are sufficient conditions, but, they, but there might be other paths as well. Okay, so now um, let's look at this problem another way. So who can identify these basketball players? Yeah, but in the other order, please. Larry Bird first, and then Magic Johnson. All right, I grew up in the 80s, so basketball was really simple back then. Celtics played the Sixers. Winner goes on and plays the Lakers. 
Uh, who here knows what beat LA means? Where did the chant beat LA come from? In the NBA finals in the 80s. No, is the other team that was playing the Lakers? So this, no. Is it, it was the conference finals in the other conference. In it was whenever the last game of that series so, was, the fans. So the, fans so, the Celt, the so the Celtics were playing the Sixers and they, Celtics fans hate the Sixers fans, but we hate the Lakers more. And so when it was clear that the Lakers were going to face the Sixers and the Celtics were going to be eliminated, the Boston Garden starts chanting, beat LA. And they're not cheering for the Celtics to beat LA, they're cheering for the Sixers. You know, Boston sports is fascinating. When the Patriots won their first Super Bowl, the chant I think you heard the most was Yankees suck at the Super Bowl parade. No other city would you celebrate one sport at another sports championship parade. So we're gonna have uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird play a game of hoops. First one to make a basket wins. We will assume that they are in their prime and they never tire. So they always have the same percentage at every moment in time of making a basket. So for simplicity, let's say Bird always gets a basket with probability P, Magic with probability Q. I could do P sub B for Bird and P sub uh, M for Magic. I'll just use P and Q. We're going to let X be the probability that Bird wins, and we want to calculate what is that probability. Okay, let's break it into cases. What's the probability Bird wins on his first shot? Yes. Yes. Uh, it would just be P. What's the probability Bird wins on his second shot? What would that be? One minus P, one minus Q times P. Bird misses, magic misses, bird hits. What's the probability bird wins on his third shot? Yes. One minus P squared, one minus Q squared. Good. So miss, 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 hit. And in general, to get on the nth shot, you have to have N minus one misses from each. Well, it's painful to keep writing one minus P, one minus Q. So let's introduce R, the common ratio. And so X, the probability that bird wins is gonna be this infinite sum. So this is a nice application of the geometric series and you know, why we might care about infinite sums like this. I wanna to try to figure out how much of an advantage, let's say P equals Q. Would you rather shoot first or second? First, right, first basket wins. You know, how much of an advantage does bird get by shooting first? How much better does magic have to be than bird to have a 50% chance of winning. Well, if Bird is sufficiently good, it doesn't matter how good Magic is. Bird will clearly have better than a 50% chance of winning. So the question is, if we know the geometric series formula, we can you know, easily calculate what this probability is, but let's calculate it without knowing the geometric series formula. And this is gonna introduce a really nice math concept. So we're gonna solve it again without using the geometric series formula. X is the probability that at the start of the game, Bird wins. So clearly, if Bird makes his first shot, he wins. If Bird doesn't make his first shot, what must be true for Bird to have a chance of winning? Yes. Um, uh, uh, Good. So Bird misses and Magic misses. So imagine both Bird and Magic miss. From this point onward, Bird now has the ball. What is the chance that Bird wins now? No. P is the probability that Bird makes the next shot. What's the probability Bird wins from this point? X. It's X. It's like we just restarted the game. So for a lot of things in life, it doesn't matter how you got to a game state. It just matters, are you in that game state? Who here has ever played a grueling game of tic-tac-toe. If I show you the board and tell you it's your turn to go, does it really matter what order the moves were done beforehand? No. What about if I show you a chess board and tell you whose turn it is? Does it matter what the moves were to get there? Why? Castling on Hassan. So castling, some special pawn moves, but there's another reason. 
Threefold repetition. If you ever have the same board state repeated three times in a chess game, the game is a draw. So for chess, it's not enough to know what the game state is. I need to know how we got there. In a baseball game, you know, I don't really need to know, was it a double and a walk? Or was it two singles or two walks? I just need to know where the runners are, how many pitches people have thrown. <laughs> so you always want to get a sense of what information really matters for a problem. Over here, once bird and magic have missed, it's like we've just started the game. And so the probability that bird wins from this point onward is just x. We've now reduced an infinite sum to a finite sum. And so now, um, I'm calling one minus p one minus q equal to r. I bring this over to the other side and get one minus r times x equals p, where x equals p over one minus r. Question? Could you make the argument that if, so say they both miss, right? That because bird, I mean, both of them are like such great players that they'll adjust from that miss. No, because I because I've made the assumption that they never tire; they always shoot at the same ability. <laughs> So I'm doing economics. My assumptions do not have to be reasonable. <laughs> In fact, they get concerned, I think, if the assumptions are reasonable. So this is the idealized game. They do not tie. In a real game, if they both start to miss, actually, this leads to a great paper if somebody's looking for something to present, the Great American Shootout, where I think originally you had somewhere between 10 and 14 players. And whoever makes a basket from the furthest distance gets a million dollars. Do you want to shoot first or last? Last, last right? If everybody before you has missed, I'm going to shoot from here. If, however, somebody has already made a basket, you know, well, I may suck. But if I shoot from before them, I have no chance of winning. So the question is, what are the odds of winning based on where you shoot? And what is the probability for each player to win? Now, let's make some simplifying assumptions. What simplifying assumption do you want to make about the players? Same skill level. Same skill level, right? We're not going to do, you know, myself, LeBron, and maybe an aging, you know, Bird or Jordan, you know, coming out of retirement, right? We'll assume everyone has the same ability. You can then say that where you shoot from, rather than measuring it in distance from the basket, just measured by the probability of making the shot. And so you, you start off at the basket with 100% chance of making the shot. And then as you walk off towards infinity, your probability is going to zero. And then it becomes a really nice question, you know, based on what's happened before you, where do you shoot? So if anybody's looking for a fun paper to present, Email me. This is a great one. A lot of you know, really nice probability and game theory and something like that. Very accessible. So now we can solve for x. We just divide by 1 minus r. And we remember that x, we calculated it as an infinite sum. And this is one of the most common techniques in mathematics. Take something you care about and do it two different ways and then show that the two are the same. And so now we get that this sum, 1 plus r plus r squared, et cetera, is equal to 1 over 1 minus r. Did we just prove the geometric series formula? If not, why not? So there's a couple of people, if you need a quotation, that should be your go-to. Winston Churchill is great. Mark Twain is great. I think one of my favorite Twain quotes is, at 14, I was ashamed at my father's ignorance. At 21, I was amazed at how much he had learned. And it's not the father who learned a lot in the seven years. Another one of his was, a cat that jumps on a lit stove won't jump on a lit stove again, nor will it jump on a cold one. To each experience in life, only extract the lesson you should. What must be true about R in this calculation? R is equal to one minus P times one minus Q. What are the possible values R can attain? It has to be between zero and one. Has to be between zero and one. So if R equals one, that means P and Q are both zero. We're in a bizarre world where bird and magic suck and can't make a basket and the game should not end. So if 
r happens to equal one, things blow up. But if r equals one, what does p equal? Zero. So you would actually have zero over zero. So the probability of bird winning would actually be undefined. Okay, that's reasonable. Okay, so r cannot be one. What else? I mean, where did you say r lives between? Zero. Zero and one. So r could not be negative, r could not be complex here. As a nice exercise for extra credit, if you know the geometric series formula for positive r, you can actually get it for negative r. So as extra credit, figure out how you would do that. I'm gonna skip that. Okay. Um, and so what I want to do now is go to you know, the main part for today's, uh, this is a paper I've been working on with a colleague for several years now. Um, we gave a talk at MathFest a few years ago and I just did an uh, sorry, a winter study with students looking at stuff like this. We actually have a lot of data I can share. If people are interested in helping us to finish this paper, this is something that I think can be presented at you know, sports conferences in Boston. It will appear in a lot of, I think, sports publications. It's a topic that is near and dear to a lot of sports fans. It's something people will argue about all the time. You know, I wish people would argue about you know, which um, integration theorem for measure theory is the best. Do you prefer dominated convergence, monotone convergence? Are you a Fatou's lemma kind of? You know, no one has arguments like that. But you know, GOAT, the greatest of all time, you know, who's the greatest of all time in sport? Pre-Brady, you could actually have some conversations in football. I think in football, you have to admit that Brady is the greatest of all time in football. And then of course, a lot of times this questions of how much of the success do you assign to the player, to other players, to the organization? You know, in terms of, you know, are you able to draft good people? And so, right. So, it does not want to move things today. Okay. So the question is, who is the greatest of all time of the greatest of all time? So one of the things we've been talking about in this class is what is the sport? So for this, let's restrict ourselves to physical sports that Joe Sixpack would give a damn about, okay? That might al allow you to include soccer. <laughs> It's, I, I think soccer has come up enough that enough people have kids who are playing soccer that, you know, even now people have heard of who Messi is and the World Cup. Pickleball will not make the list. Even though I was telling someone, I had seen in the ESPN, you know, top 10 highlights of the week. One of the top 10 was from a pickleball game. I just would not have seen this when I was growing up. So what sports do you want to consider for this? Basketball, basketball football, football baseball, baseball hockey. hockey we'll put in soccer anything else so do you want to consider something like tennis now what's interesting about tennis is you have singles and doubles and that's it and in a lot of these sports so much of how good you are is the function of how good is the number two at that time. And in something like tennis, when it's you're extremely individual, uh, if you happen to be at the right time without any strong competitors, you're in great shape. You could put in gymnastics as well. And you have some people who, if they're just born at the right time, they have a chance of being in three Olympics. But you know, for a lot of people, if you're just born at the wrong time, you have no chance. So we might want to restrict ourselves to team sports, teams with at least five players. So again, it's an interesting question as to what do you want to you know, consider for your range of discourse? Okay, so we've been talking throughout the semester about how important metrics are. So the following is from a piece of paper I had on my office door in the old Bronfman. 
So it's from June 4th, 2018. The Sox were 41 and 19, winning percentage of 683. The Evil Empire was 37 and 17, with a winning percentage of 685. Who's in first, Red Sox or Yankees? So, so Google reported the Yankees in first because the Yankees had a higher winning percentage. ESPN correctly determined that the Red Sox were in first. So what do you think? Which is more important? The slightly better winning percentage? Yes. Uh, I would say, like, honestly, if you could look on like the MLB website, probably is the exact definition of what first place is. Right. Like, you have to go on whatever the league's exact definition is. But whether it's like winning percentage or like, but, how they but I'm letting you choose right now. Which do you think is, is better? The Sox? I mean, again, this is a ridiculous situation where the Sox have played six additional games over the Yankees and gone four and two. I mean, if, if that was the case where the season didn't necessarily have to end with everyone playing the same amount of games, mm -hmm. they want to go win percentage. So yes. A like, like team that plays less games doesn't have no chance of getting first. Right. To, to some extent, this is a question we shouldn't even be discussing. It doesn't really matter who's in first now. When does it matter who's in first? At the end of the season. So if you're trying to get a sense right now, you are the Sox in, which you think is more important that the, that the teams are playing 683, 685, or that in those extra six games, the Sox have gone four and two? What would the Yankees have to do in those six games to get above the Red Sox? We know if they won the tiebreaker game. Um, I do not. Oh, because if, if it's if they have like the tiebreaker game, they'd have to win four, otherwise they'd have to win five. So, if the Yankees want to have a better record than the Red Sox, they've got to either go five for six or six for six. And you can calculate what is the probability that they do that if they're playing, say, six eighty five ball. A lot of it might depend on who those extra games are against. If the Yankees go four and two, however which would actually be playing below their normal ability because they're playing above 666. Then the Yankees would tie the Red Sox. So you might say, yeah, the Yankees have to play six more games, but you know, they should be able to go at least four and two, which would bring them to the <laughs> level of the Sox. And they have a decent chance of actually going five or six wins. Why might you say the Sox are in better shape than the Yankees? And now you need a little bit of baseball knowledge. Uh, well, I don't know if this has anything to do with baseball specifically, but you could argue that it's harder to maintain a high winning percentage over a longer period of time. And like your players get good. more down. So good. So this is, you know, almost regression to the mean that we don't really think the teams are playing this well. It's early in the season. And so the 683, 685 may not be an accurate assessment. You know, if a team is playing 600 ball at the end of the season, that's really good. There's something else you need to know a little bit of baseball knowledge. Yeah. A lot of variability in baseball, so it's hard to win. Even the best teams like won't win more than 100, 105 games. Right. So there's a guaranteed amount of losses. But there's something else about the Sox having played six more games than the Yankees at this point. Yes. The Yankees are going to have double headers. The Yankees are going to have either double headers or they're going to have fewer travel, fewer rest days. So that means their bullpen is going to be taxed a bit more. So strategically, when I look at this, I would say. I would much rather be the Red Sox and have six fewer games to play for the rest of the season and to be able to have a little bit more time to rest players. But again, this is an example of it's the wrong question to be asking. You really shouldn't be caring right now who's in first. Both teams are doing extremely well. You see Tampa is next, you know, 12 games behind. So this is data from you know, 2018. Why am I showing you a snapshot that I took from my door? What could I have done if I really wanted to give you a good, clean, clear slide? What should I have done? If I'd actually cared about you in this class, I don't. It's Friday, tired. It's a half day for my kids. I got to get home. I had three school committee meetings yesterday. Didn't really want to prepare a lecture. What should I have done to make this slide better? Yeah. Uh, 
You could have shown like the results of like multiple years or like. like well, no, I, I want to talk about this specific day, June 4th, 2018. What could I have done? So I could have gone to the MLB website, right? So is the reason I didn't do this because I don't care about you? You need to know a little bit about how baseball is scored. And again, this is one of the themes of the class is always think about how are they presenting data? Who's read 1984? Where does he work? Where does Winston work? Liberal arts college guys, come on. Ministry of Truth. What is his job? I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite phrase it as that. His job is to make sure that all past documents are in line with the current reality. And so if there is, all of a sudden, if Eurasia is now our enemy, we now have to go back and change the old documents. And now it's East Asia that's you know, the wonderful you know, country supporting us in our aims against the evil hordes from. What happens if there's a rain delay in a baseball game and it's resumed? Who knows baseball stats? They resume it, they play from where they stop. They play from where it stopped and the stats actually count for that day. So one of the games, that's the reason why the Yankees are six games fewer than the Red Sox <laughs> is the Yankees had a rain delay. And when they resumed that rain delay, the Yankees won. And so now if you go back to the stats from June 4th, the Yankees actually are beating the Sox in both categories, in you know, the one loss record and the winning percentage. That's why I can't actually go back to MLB or any of those other websites because they have now adjusted and put in the completion of that game. There are people who have hit their first Major League Baseball home run before they were called up to the majors. Because you have situations like this where someone is called up and then they are playing in a rain delay game. And so that stat actually counts from before. So you can have some strange things like this. Again, most of the time this doesn't matter, but I really want you to always be thinking when you're looking at statistics, is it really measuring what you want? And over here, this is not measuring anything we really care about. Okay. I'm not going to go through other things, but um, you know, my colleague talked about some cross-country examples where when you have multiple people competing, depending on how you do your scoring, you can actually have different people coming out as the winner. Okay, so when we're trying to answer this question, who is the greatest of all time? If you choose the metric appropriately, you can strengthen your case. Who here has ever done a uh, class where they talk about p-values. When do you use 5% and when do you use 1%? You're supposed to use it before. You're supposed to use it before. Survey, but it depends, depends how low your, your p-value is. Right. If your data is significant at the 1% level, but not, well then, okay, great. If your data is significant at the 5% level, but not at the 1% level, then use the 5%. So there's a lot of real concern. So a lot of people have stopped claiming significance. And what they do is instead, they just report the p-value. The p-value was 4.7. And then you can decide what you want to make of that. And so we have to decide what metrics do we want for the greatest of all time. So this is one of the nice things about a class like this. This is something you can talk to hopefully almost anybody on campus. What do you think should be important metrics in trying to determine who is the greatest of all time? What do you think matters? And by how much? Championships matter. Championships. So here's my question. In a four-year window, the Buffalo Bills made it to the Super Bowl and lost. Does anybody know the joke about the Bills in Africa? <laughs> so as soon as you win the Super Bowl, they put on shirts that say champion. How do they get the shirts made so quickly? Well, they have to make them for both teams. 
And so the joke is that well, they send the shirts from the team that lost to the third world. It's like, oh, they did it again, Florida, oh, go Bills. So the Bills have a four year window where they made it to the Super Bowl and lost. How does that compare to a four year window where the Patriots have two championships, missing the playoffs with a nine and seven record on the third and fourth tie break, and maybe like a five and 11 season? Which would you rather have? Four appearances or two rings, just missing the playoffs and a bad but not horrendous year. Is there anybody who would rather have the four appearances? So I think we can all agree the four appearances is not as good as two rings and the other two seasons. What if you have one ring and then three seasons in last place versus four losses in the Super Bowl? You know, wide right, wide left, wide left, wide right again for old time's sakes. Which would you rather have? We need to come up with some kind of conversion factor. How many people would rather have four losses in the Super Bowl versus one win for your team and three disastrous seasons? Is there anybody who would rather have sustained competence, sustained excellence, but not getting the job done? Okay, so we've got a couple of people. So we have three people who would rather have that. Who would rather have the one win and then, because then in the history books, we've got the win for them. We've got memories, we've got the parade. This is the difficulty. When you're trying to come up with comparisons, you have to decide how many points should you give someone for making it to the Super Bowl and losing. I think we can all agree two championships and you know, an okay season, just barely missing the playoffs, and a bad season is much better than four appearances in the Super Bowl. That's easy. But when you're trying to do something like this, it gets much, much harder. Okay, so one possibility for greatest of all time is championships. What else do you think might matter? Uh, consistency. Consistency. In what sense? Well, like, are you... You know, the top for one year or the top for like several years. Okay, but top in, in what sense? You have to give me a statistic. Um, I'm just, I'm thinking like, up, you know, the example that comes to mind is like in basketball, right. like, you know, Kevin Durant is like always in the conversation for one of the best scores. Like okay, a so, so, so it's looking at a statistic for an individual. Yeah. You know, are you one of the top scorers consistently? Are you one of the best quarterback, you know, passing ratings consistently? So there's you know, individual statistics. How do you translate statistics from one sport to another? Yes. You could look at all pro selections in the NFL, all sports okay. selections in the NBA, all teams. Like so you can look at some things like that. Um, there could be some issues based on position you play. But looking at you, know, are you considered an all-star? but it's more than just an all-star. It might be, how much is your contribution? Which sport do you think the player has the greatest contribution and which one do you think they have the least? Yes. I guess greatest in basketball. Maybe basketball, hockey, you, know, you have fewer people on the court or on the ice. In football or baseball, you've basically got your offense and your defense. Now, except for the pitcher, you know, the hitter, is typically also a fielder now. So now we have the DH rule everywhere. How do you rate the contribution of a quarterback to a team winning? They need the offensive line to protect them. They need a viable running threat. They need a viable passing threat. They need a good defense so that they're not starting back up in their, you know, deep in their own territory where they don't have enough room to run plays. So, if you say, you know, you're trying to assign you, know, how much is Brady contributing? He's typically there only for about half the plays, maybe. And a lot of it is, you know, does the defense set him up in good position? Have they intercepted the ball? Have they held the other team? Um, if the defense is able to hold the other team quickly and you get back on the field, the other team's defense will then be tired. And there's advantages to that. And so it becomes extremely hard to figure out how much credit do we want to give someone? This is one of the reasons why we care so much about you know, certain statistics. We're trying to figure out how much are you contributing to the victory? 
Baseball, it's much easier to isolate the contributions. Which statistics do people not like in baseball that in the past were historically liked? Wins for pitcher. You know, so much of that is a function of what your team is doing. Uh, Pete Rose was managing the Reds one year and they were playing a double header on the road. They scored five runs in the first inning. He switched the pitchers because he had his stronger pitcher pitching in the first game. Well, he hadn't thrown any balls yet. So put in the weaker pitcher and spot him a 5 1 lead. Another statistic that's you know, a little bit concerning in baseball is runs batted in. If you're on a team that doesn't really put up base runners, or if you're in a certain part of the batting order, you're not going to have as many opportunities for that. We would love to be able to answer who's the greatest of all time across sports. It's hard enough to answer this just within a sport. How do you compare a quarterback to a receiver to, um, say, a you know, defensive player? How do you compare it to a kicker who can put the other team deep in their own territory, who can make long field goals for you? Yes? Could you use like salary and say that's like correlated with like how good a player is? So I, it's definitely correlated, but you have a lot of people who early in their career get crappy salaries. You also have some teams that overpay because they want to just win a championship. It's like, look, you're not worth this much, but we have the money and we can afford to do it. Uh, Pedro Martinez with the New York Mets, who are my Mets fans? Okay. This is before your time, but after Martinez won the World Series with the Red Sox, he went to the Mets for four years for a very nice contract. And the Sox fans were sad to see him go. He'd been one of the most dominant pitchers for a decade, but he was on the tail end of his career. There was no way he was going to be worth that money in years three and four. But in year one, yes. And if you think you're close enough to make a run for the title, you can absolutely pay a lot of money. So I agree that there's a correlation between salaries and the value of someone. And you know, a lot of things in the world, if you want to get a sense of something's value, you look at how much people are willing to pay for it. But people are often willing to overpay for a chance to win the title. You know, this is the missing piece I need. I think it's a really hard question. If anybody has a good solution, we've been you know, thinking about this for two years. You know, it's hard enough to compare within a sport. To compare across the sports is very difficult. Um, just a couple of quick thoughts. The people that quickly came to mind was Tom Brady for the NFL, Bill Russell for the NBA. I did not buy one of his baseball cards for the card challenge because those cards were way above what I was willing to spend you know, for class. Uh, I would say Babe Ruth for MLB. But actually, after we did some of the analysis, Yogi Berra became a really interesting candidate where he gets credit not just for the wins as a player, but the wins as a manager. Uh, hockey, who should we put up? Gretzky. And then anybody you want to put up in any of these other sports? Not just Carlson. Why? He has the highest, currently the highest rating. Ever in, in the five mm-hmm. But this is not a team sport. <laughs> so it's got to be a team sport. Now, if he was doing bug house chess, yeah. that would be different. Anybody else you want to put up for basketball? So B- Bill Russell won 11 championships in 13 years, but it was a far smaller league back then. Uh, I'll, I'll make an argument for LeBron James. <laughs> LeBron James, I think, definitely should be in the conversation. Yes. Yeah, you have to put Michael Jordan in, right? And was LeBron in Space Jam too? Unfortunately. Yeah, so I have to take off points. Yeah. You know, I, I, I will give Michael Jordan points for Space Jam. So how do you judge people across time when the leagues are very different? So when Bill Russell was playing, there were far fewer teams. The playoff uh, situation was very different. You also don't have free agency. One of the things that makes the Patriots run so damn impressive is they did this in an era of salary cap and free agency. Uh, Brady actually took a million dollar pay cut one year so that the 
Palace could sign Randy Moss. So we need to figure out how to analyze stuff like this. And so instead of trying to figure out who is the greatest of all time, we're going to look for the best of all teammates. So again, this is what you need to do. It's what problems can I answer? If anybody can come up with a way to answer who is the greatest of all time across sports, I am open to the conversation. Fundamentally, I think there's just too many issues. The best of all teammates does not mean that you contributed the most to the success. You could just be your bat boy and you're just present when things happen. I think that's much easier to then compare across sports. Who has seen the most success? And now we're judging it by a team. So what would you consider success for a team? Championships, what else? Division titles, playoff appearances, playoff wins. So stuff like this now becomes very good. How much weight do you want to give to the regular season? Say right, especially in football. In football, you can be eliminated with one game, and so the regular season often gives you seeding for the playoffs. So you got to be very careful not to double count something, or maybe you double count, but it's double counted deliberately. If you look at on base percentage, if you look at slugging, well, slugging. I'm sorry, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong thing. On base plus slugging, right? A single is counted twice in on base plus slugging. It's counted in your on base, it's counted in your slugging. So on base plus slugging, it's counted twice. So when we're trying to figure out how much is the regular season worth, well, doing well in the regular season lines you up for a better playoff run, which gives you a chance to get the big points for winning stuff like that. We need to figure out how much should a championship be worth? Do you give extra points if you win multiple championships in a short period, is it better to win two championships back to back, three championships back to back to back than to spread it out over a seven year window? It's the same total success, but if you have it more clustered, you start talking about dynasty. So you know, these are things you have to think about. Um, so you're trying to look at uh, making the playoffs as just you know, one of the initial things that if you're going to be the you know, best of all teammates, if you want to see success, you've got to make the playoffs. So let's try to come up with a simple model of trying to calculate how impressive Brady and Bill Russell were. And so this was done a while ago. I should update these numbers. Uh, Brady has made the playoffs 18 times in 20 years in a 32-team league with 12 playoff qualifiers. So if you just do a very simple binomial model, has everybody here seen binomial? N choose K. And what you want to do is you want to calculate what's the probability you have either 18, 19, or 20 successes in a 20 year window. It would be 20 choose 18 times the probability to the 18, one minus the probability squared plus 20 choose 19 plus 20 choose 20. So when you calculate that, you get a damn small number. Um, It's just, it doesn't, does not want to move to that. All, right. um, all right, so when we look at Bill Russell, uh, Russell, so Brady has um, seven titles in 20 years. If we calculate that 0.00000149, Russell 11 titles in 13 years, but in a 10 team league, it's about 10 to the negative 10 versus 10 to the negative six for Brady. So at this point, you know, it looks like Bill Russell winning 11 and 13 is far more impressive than seven in 20. What do you think? Which is the more impressive statistic? Seven Super Bowl rings in 20 years in the modern era, or Bill Russell's 11 in 13 years back in essentially the 60s? So we talked about before how basketball is more like Player sport. Mm -hmm. like, but again, I don't player. care about the contribution to success. I just care who has seen the most success. Oh, Bill Russell. So Bill Russell, I mean, you've got 11 champion, 
ships in 13 years, that seems like you're seeing more success. Um, I'm having trouble wording this, but you could say something about like, maybe they're not all independent, like because if he won so many in such a cluster of time, like maybe the, there was just like a five year span where the league was really weak. And so like winning. Right, and, so in, and in fact, if you look at who else has seen a lot of success in basketball, who do you think is going to be on that list? His teammates. Right, you know, if you have a dominant team, they're all going to be getting credit. Now, Russell has a longer stretch than a lot of them. The big difference is Brady played in games, Russell played in series. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the probability that the stronger team beats the weaker team in a one-game series, a three-game, a five-game, or a seven-game. And so if the probability... Um, Oh, oh is it not including the bottom? Oh, so it did not include the probability in the bottom. Okay. Okay, the vertical axis is the probability the stronger team wins. The horizontal axis is the probability the stronger team wins any one game. So if you have a 50% chance of winning in a game, not surprisingly, doesn't matter how long the series is, you'll win the series half the time. If you have a 100% chance of winning any game, doesn't matter how long the series is, you'll win. But what's fascinating is looking at the difference of what is your probability of winning a longer series? What's happening as we play more and more games in the series? What happens to the probability of the stronger team winning? It becomes higher. If you were to play your know, best of a million and one, you don't have to be that much better. Central limit theorem is going to kick in. And with extremely high probability, you know, if you're winning 52% you know, of the games with a million games, you should be the one to have the majority of the wins. For small series, you know, three, five, seven, there's an effect, but it's not as pronounced. And you can even ask, you know, where's that sweet spot? Where is you know, the biggest difference in going from a best of one to a best of seven? But you see there is a sizable change in your probability of winning. And so we tried to do some calculations. I'll skip those statistics. So this was basically using, we talked about this in the first class, Bill James log five formula, what is the probability, you know, team A beats team B to use this to try to quantify if I have, you know, a championship game or a playoff game between two teams, what's the probability one beats the other? We talked about why that was true, so I don't have to go through those slides. And so looking at you know, what we'll call the log five adjustment for best of seven versus a best of one, and you're looking at, you know, what the differences are in the probabilities. And so, you know, so much of what you're going to do in this class, as well as beyond this class, is how do you present data in a way that's clear and highlights what's going on? So let's look at the difference between the best of seven and the best of one. Well, not surprisingly, the difference is zero at the extremes. But when you're winning around 85% of the time, you're seeing a difference of more than 1.5, maybe around 1.8. <coughs> and so, when we do these calculations, it's not unreasonable to say that the advantage of playing series versus a best of one is a fact of 1.8, that the better team is going to survive far more often in a best of seven environment. And you're gonna have, a you know, if you're good, you're gonna have more of a chance of winning. And so when you do that, Russell has 11 titles, but if we say maybe, there's this fact of 1.8. Anybody know what seven times 1.8 is? About 12.6. So if you look at it like that, you're seeing a, a, a comparable number of titles. Could you say that it's more like, you could say that it's harder, but you could also say that it's just like, it needs like, more random in terms of like Brady might not have had the best team some years, so one, the best team. Well, so, so, so this is the, the question we need to figure out. And you're, again, there's a lot of interest. We've, we've talked to a lot of people about this, trying to figure out who has seen the most success, is we have to decide what do we want success to be? Not who's contributing to it, just what do we consider success? And how do we compare success across different sports? Where in some sports, it's going to be harder. Football is structured to be hard. You have a slightly harder schedule if you do well. You have 
one game do or dies. You have salary caps. You can't really build the dominant team. And so these are all things we need to discuss. All right, so for Monday's class, we're going to do Markov chains. How many people have ever seen a Markov chain? Most have not. So we're going to start doing you know, the real theory behind things, and then this will prepare us for some of the papers. All right, have a good weekend.